corridor. So we wanna welcome you for taking the time out uh, your busy schedule to join us today. And we're gonna do have a discussion about access and procurement opportunities. Uh, as you were uh, the announcement was made, um, we're watching your questions so you can drop those into the chat. If you'd like to put your name or your company and any information about your company in the chat, we'll see that at the end of the meeting and therefore we'll all have it so that we can do networking afterwards. If there's some questions that you have that we don't get to, we'll seize those and my email will pop up at the end of this and you have uh, access to both me and my agency, um, which ones you want to. So let's, let's get to it so we can get through what I call the small stuff. Because the big stuff is always you guys and what you guys need to know. So, like I said, I represent GSA. Uh, the General Service Administration is the executive branch of the federal government that's responsible for the day-to-day -day procurement for everything that the federal government needs basically to do business. We are the federal landlords. We own the federal buildings. We own the federal courthouses. We own the, the historical custom houses around the country. But we also own... Uh, the, well, it's on the White House and also the Capitol building. So when you look at GSA, you're looking at a major buying entity worldwide. We have the biggest spend besides DOD of all the federal budget. So therefore, if you're doing business with GSA, you have access to people who are buying almost everything that you can, you can think of. And we like to say, we, don't, we can't tell you what we do buy, but we can tell you what we don't buy. The only thing we don't buy is weapon systems. Everything else, GSA buys it for internal consumption or we buy it for our customer base, which is every other agency, including DOD, NASA. So when you're looking at federal contracts, you're actually looking at a process that may be bureaucratic, but we like, we like to say that the check always clears. So if you're a small business, large business, uh, whatever, there is a chance for you to do business with the federal government. Uh, a lot of people today may have joined this conference because you offer training, you offer um, soft, what was called soft skills. The soft skills training thing is something that GSA procures a lot of uh, in the tunes of millions and billions of dollars for other agencies. And we do it through our massive, multiple award contracts that allow any federal agency to use our contracts, get the goods and services. So although GSA may not buy it, they will contract for you to sell it or provide those goods and services to any federal agency out there. So why, why would an office like mine, which is the Office of Small Business, Small and Disadvantaged Business exist? Um, we exist because of public law. And the public law um, 995-507 actually established the offices of small and disadvantaged businesses in every executive agency. So every federal agency has a small business office. Now it says small, but when you talk about agencies spending um, trillions of dollars like DOD or GSA who basically contracts one third of the whole federal spend, you're talking about agencies that do a lot of contracts, some for small things, some for large things. And for, we try to provide everything that the federal agencies would need through our contracts so that they don't have to go out and do those contracts. It allows us to basically uh, consolidate the buying power of one federal agency buying for everybody and the needs, or you might buy a thousand widgets at uh, HHS, GSA would buy a million widgets and provide that thousand to HHS. So what does that require? It advocates with the federal, federal executive agencies for the maximum practical use of all designated small business categories within the federal acquisition process. What that means is that we are mandated to ensure that every penny that the federal government spends is that 
if a small business can do that work, we must allow small business to bid on that work. And I, I make that clear. We must allow you to bid on the work. We can't force you to, but we allow you to bid on the work before we take it out and we set it aside and let large business bid against you. So that's why the small business office exists to ensure that we follow that act. We ensure inclusion of small business as sources for goods and services in federal acquisition as prime contractors and subcontractors. So you can either do a contract directly with the federal government, or you can do a contract with those agencies who have uh, contracts with federal government. That's what a lot of small businesses do. A lot of large businesses do the same thing. That, that subcontracting portion of the work that we do is very important to small business because that's how you usually get to the table. It's how you get the experience in federal contracting. It's also how you protect your company. By being a subcontractor, you're not directly responsible to the federal government for that contract, for those goods and services. You're actually going through a bigger company, like a Raytheon, a General Dynamics, Booz Allen. Um, those guys are billion dollar companies. We consider them other than small, basically a large companies who provide those goods and services. They have direct contracts with the federal government. Those direct contracts require them to put a portion of that contract back into small businesses. And that's what a subcontracting portion comes in. That's where small businesses really do sometimes as much as 50 to 60% of that work is being done by small business scattered across the country, scattered across all types of different um, jobs and career fields. We also manage a small business utilization program for our respective organization. So the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business, OSTABU, job is to manage within its agency how it utilizes the small business program. We are more of a compliance uh, group than we are a actual contracting group. We oversee contracts. I review all the contracts that come out of New England for GSA. And any work that GSA is doing for other agencies like the Air Force, the Army or the Navy goes to our office to ensure that those contractors, those contracts are actually looked at for small businesses first. If small businesses can't do it, well, they technically can't do it or they don't have the expertise or the manpower or whatever, then we make a decision, okay, then we will go ahead and let that work go forward as a large contract. Otherwise, we keep that money in the small business community. So steps to develop your, your we call it a market analysis. Whenever a, a business, whenever you're looking to do business with any agency, any company, this is a good tool. Which age, federal agencies are purchasing your products or your service? You want to know that because you don't want to waste your time talking to people who have, have never bought what you sell, have no intention of buying what you sell, and a lot of times don't have the money to buy what you sell. So you, you want to do your research into the agencies um, by doing a market analysis of that agency. And you can do that several ways. You can do it yourself by going through databases, and there's a lot of databases out there. Or you can go and sign up to be a uh, client of the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, which are called PTACs, but I think now they're doing business as Apex Accelerators. You can go to the Small Business Agency, SBA. They have a Small Business Development Center that will help you. You can go to SCORE, which is a volunteer group of uh, senior executives from who've retired, who volunteer their time to help companies uh, get started. So all these things will help you um, develop that market analysis so that you're focused in on people who really uh, buy what you are selling or want to do business with companies like yours. So how much are they buying? Market analysis will tell you that. And have they awarded any set-asides? Now, the word set-asides, a lot of small business here, and they think that, well, they're going to give me a contract. No, the federal government uh, doesn't give out, give contracts. You compete for contracts. Even in a set aside, the set aside will be set aside for certain groups, but within that group, you still have to compete. 
So that competition is important and you develop those things by developing your business strategy and people like SBA at the PTAC and the Small Business, Small Business Development Center, WeBank, which is a woman in entrepreneurial development center, those companies, those agencies will help you develop uh, your strategy towards set-asides on whether or not you should even ask or take your time to go at the set-asides. Who are my competitors and who holds the current contract? It's always good to know who you're competing against. Some people have an advantage because they've been in the game longer. They have more money to throw at these things. And remember that in most federal contracts, you're going to do a uh, request for proposals going to come out from there. You said, hey, we got this requirement. Would you like to propose a solution and a cost? They take your bid and they compare it against other bids. So usually if you've been doing that work for the agency for a while, you have more insight into what they need. So therefore, those people do have a slight advantage. It's, you know what they need because you've been working with them for years. You've held that contract. You know the requirements. So when you're competing, it's like you want to know, who am I competing against? You know, sometimes you, you make your decision, a uh, business decision, that we will not go forward uh, and compete on this because we think this contract contractor is so embedded in the organization. We have so much knowledge that we can't compete with that. We're new to this and we just don't want to do, do it. I'm sorry, I actually, <laughs> I couldn't see my slide. I hope everyone can see that that right hand slide because in, in mine it's actually uh, being blocked. So let me see if I can get that out of the way so that I can. Okay. What contracts are, are uh, set to expire that I can compete for in the future? Now this type of uh, data search is really important because what you're doing is you're building your your two your five year strategy of what type of work you're going to go for. And what you're looking at is existing contracts that are out there that companies and the companies who have them today, but that contract expires. Almost every contract has an expiration date. They're used for like two to five years, the base year plus additional option years that the federal government can go into. So if it's going to expire in 2025, the latest that you would want to start looking at your strategy to go after that work would be 2024, it's probably around the spring of 2024. You start doing your market analysis, you start looking at it and said, okay, this company's had this contract only two years, three years. So, you know, they may be good, they may, be, but we can still compete with them. And you just make your strategy that you're going to go after that work at that point. It's, it's not, um, it's not a bad thing. It's all. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to always know who's in your space, who you're competing against, who, who has that uh, advantage. And then sometimes those companies who've been there a while have tied up so much of their resources, they're looking to get out of that contract. So that, that's the type of thing that you kind of get from doing that, that process of reviewing, you know, what's out there, when it's coming up again in the future. And a lot of times you can often go to those companies and partner with them because for they were tying up 100% of their resources on the contract by partnering with you, which is allowed in federal contract or two or more companies can come together and form a partnership to do that work. You have the experience of the company who holds the contract, but you also have this fresh set of resources from the partner company that allows them to go after that contract and then go after other contracts because all their resources are no longer tied up on that one contract. Let the data refine your overall strategy. It's important that you follow, follow the data. And when they say follow the data, what we really mean is you follow the money. Here's why. Because no matter what the data is saying, <clears throat> the data is going to say, there's a need. The federal government has a need. The federal government uh, has a contract out there already, or they do not, or they're going to put a contract out there. But 
It also tells you who the organization who's going to receive that work. Who are you doing the work for? And if you're doing the work for them, you can actually go to their budget and look at their budget and see how much money was in their budget for how long? How long did they get funding for this project? Is this a two-year project, a five-year project? It's usually right there in the congressional budget data showing you that Congress approved $10 million for a five-year uh, review of transportation to and from work. And if that's where you want to go for, then you know you got a five-year contract probably coming out of that, at least a three to five years. So therefore, it's worth your time to do the work and get involved. When you're looking to find these opportunities, things like today, events where you can meet people, uh, companies like yours, unlike yours, is where you want to be. You want people to see your company. You want to be seen and let them know that you're interested. And being interested in a project is not the same as tying up all your resources. It's letting the contracting officers, the agencies know that, hey, this is what we do. If when you're working with the uh, training organizations like PTAC, SBA, WeBank, and SCORE, they will teach you how to put together your marketing strategy where you're letting every agency that you've targeted know that you exist, what type of organization you are, what type of things you offer, all those things will be involved in that package and you send it out to those different organizations. I get them all the time from different companies around the world. GSA is an international buying agency. We supply goods and services to everything from USA to, to the UN to NATO. It depends on the funding type of way. Uh, so yeah, we have companies on contract who reside in Australia. We have companies who reside in Germany, but they're providing goods and service to our U.S. forces overseas. So wherever there's American presence, either in the State Department or the military, GSA often provides uh, goods and services to support those missions. That's one of our other roles is to be a provider that. So know which agency forecast tools to use. Every agency, remember earlier we said every agency has a small business office. Every one of those small business offices are required to ensure that their agency produces a forecast to some of them. It's just a matter of an Excel spreadsheet that you pull down. Some of them is just a, a portal on, the, uh, on their website. GSA actually has a forecast to GSA's forecast to allows you to see what GSA has out there as far as opportunities, but it also allows you to see other agencies who signed up also to be on that forecast too. Once again, we built a tool and we put it out for the rest of the federal government to use. And slowly those agencies are migrating to that too. Hopefully in the near future, there will be one federal forecast too, where you can go to and you can go through and you see every agency, what they're offering, the type of things they're buying, um, who's responsible and who you can contact to get more information. Become as efficient as you can. Don't waste your time. You know, uh, you gotta, you're going to see a lot of stuff out there. The more you know about who you want to work with, the more you know about what you want to sell and who to, and whether they got money, the easier it's going to be for you. It's going to always make sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck, the best for your marketing dollar, the best for your time. For small businesses, especially time is money. So you want to make sure that you're putting your time into something that's very um, strategic and has the best chance of getting you that contract. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's about, the contract. Uh, SAM.gov is, is something you're going to hear about when you're looking at federal government. If there are any of you, especially now, who are doing uh, work with HHS, you, you probably, if you apply for grants, if you have a community grant or any type of grant from Health and Human Services, uh, education, all those grants require you to be enrolled in SAM.gov. Now, SAM.gov is, is new. It's probably, we've only had it online about three years at the most right now, before we had a beta product out there. 
Now sound.gov itself is up and running, but we're constantly improving on sound.gov because it is so essential. I just recently worked with the uh, congressman out of Northern Maine along the Canadian border because of the libraries up there who were trying to get grant money, who usually get grant money, could not get their sound.gov account established in time to receive their grants. So if you're getting grant money or any payments from the federal government through uh, directly as a business or a private organization, a nonprofit, you're going to have to have a SAM.gov account for that money transfer. It's required. So SAM.gov is also where we list opportunities too. It's mainly that's what we designed it for, but it recently we realized how important it was to the nonprofit community, the state agencies, um, any type of federal funding comes through the SAM.gov portal and that information that you put in there. So normally it lists all the opportunities over $25,000, which has to go in there. So if it's over $25,000, the, the law requires them to put it in SAM.gov and every agency does that. You can use it to search for opportunities, request for information, sources salt, and requests for quotes um, are also posted in SAM.gov. It offers the vendor collaboration central uh, event listing, which means you can go in there and find training events, uh, just networking events. All those things are, can be listed in SAM.gov and agencies are now using SAM.gov to list those things. So if you want to know what's happening in DOD, you want to know what happened in GSA, HHS, those events can be posted in SAM.gov. You can go in there and look. It is not a requirement that all of their events be put in there, but Enough of them are put in there so that it makes it worth your while to track that. It publishes events on the small business event and outreach training. So we said small business events, but when you go to sell.gov, you're going to see a little bit of everything in there. It's up to the agency what they want to post in there. So a lot of times they're posting networking. Uh, I've seen a little bit of, of everything in there. From depends upon what the agency does. It just gives them a one, it's just a one-stop shopping where you can post all your events that you're holding at your agency. And uh, that's what we use it for. Uh, you, you'll see down here at the bottom, the SAM.gov uh, content home, if you want to go in and just browse through it. Like I said, if you are a business, you should be in SAM.gov. Um, one reminder that in SAM.gov, when you're doing your business um, identity, you're creating your, your account, Make sure that you look at the small business um, dynamic search engine portion of it, because that's where you also go in and put that information about your company. So that when a contracting officer or an agency is looking for a specific type of company, they use that dynamic search engine to pull up your information. So it's actually two different uh, data engines running at the same time, SAM.gov, has all the information about payments, how you get paid and who you pay. It's got your bank account and all that stuff. So SAM.gov is very important to a company. It's also uh, has a lot of security features that may be annoying. But when you think of the fact that this is how you get paid, this is how millions and billions of dollars are being transferred to, to organizations and to companies, you will realize why it is so critical that we have to have the strongest security uh, procedures there. Only certain people have access to your data. And if you're going to sit up a SAM.gov or do any type of grant work, for, make sure the people that you put in charge that you give access to SAM.gov, you make sure that there's multiple people in your organization who have the password and and everything for that. Because what we are finding is that as people, especially nonprofits, or people volunteering, the volunteer last year might not come back this year. Well, the volunteer last year had all the, the information about your SAM.gov, either in their personal computer, their laptop, their phone, or whatever. And when they left, they took it with them. We've often had where companies were contracted to do the SAM.gov management for certain companies. Well, those companies fell out of grace, they no longer were partnered, they were, they were no longer, their relationship um, died. And guess what? The contractor had all the information about the uh, SAM.gov account. So if they own your data, 
They own how you get paid. So that's why Sam.gov is so essential, is so important. We have lots of information out there. We have a federal help desk to help people get through it. Uh, me and my compadres around the country, we act as a resource to expedite and clear up issues for nonprofits and, and even states. I'm working with the state of uh, Rhode Island right now to get some things cleared up so that they can get paid. Because when a state agency puts in for grants, usually that state agency applies directly to the federal government. When the federal government gets ready to pay that grant, a lot of time that grant is being paid through the Sam Gubb process. So if that data is wrong, then that state agency can't get paid. And so we, we had some issues with that. So we're clearing it up. So there's a lot of things out there. SAM.gov is becoming more and more essential, mainly because follow the money. If that's what keeps you from getting paid, that's essential to your company. If that's how we pay you at the end of the day for the contract work you do for us, it's essential to your company. It's essential to your nonprofit. It's essential to those community groups out there. Everybody from dance to Boy Scout troops that are put in for grants. Uh, the police officers, um, Morser, uh, Mass, had an issue with their SAM.gov. They couldn't get their federal grants. They needed to pay the officers that they had on the payroll who basically came and were being paid for by grant money. So a lot of those things are important to the community as well as to companies. Statutory limitations and the requirements. Uh, any other than small business, large business, essential, are required to submit a subcontracting plan. So subcontracting is, is, is very important to small business because here's why. Most of the small business are not going to get a five, 10, 20 billion dollar contract from any federal agency. However, those companies who get those five, 20 and more billion dollar contracts are often required within their contract to do what we call a subcontracting plan. Within that subcontracting plan, they will identify uh, how they're going to basically trickle down that money to small businesses. They'll set aside 30% of the contract or whatever the contract or so many millions, so many billions, and sometimes it is billions, especially when you're talking about IT and technology. It's sometimes it's like we got $2.5 billion to, to put into small businesses. So when you hear that, like we're going to subcontract 2.5 billion, you realize that their profit margin must be very high. So therefore that, that becomes um, an issue. So the other than small business do, do their subcontracting plan. Within that plan, they have to demonstrate the maximum practical opportunities, which is a little term, just say, you're gonna do the best you can to make sure that small business can participate with your company as a subcontractor. That maximum practical opportunities and your, that best foot forward is what my office is required to review and to ensure that it's happening. So since the, the original uh, FAR, a lot of things have happened that it gives the agencies more authority to uh, investigate claims where maybe a small business would promise work, and, but they didn't get the work or small business was doing work and they're not getting paid on time. So there's a lot of things now where we as agencies have leverage um, to ensure that those small businesses are being treated properly. And um, we take that very serious. The requirements for a subcontracting plan does not apply to small business. So if you are a small business, now a small and large business is defined by the NICS code or the non, it's basically the goods and services you provide. There's a federal code that says, okay, these companies can only have so much in profit will be so large. So it is a well-defined process that the Small Business Administration oversees that defines what is a small or large business. And it depends upon what goods and services that are being provided that company does. Every small business is not the same. Every large business is not the same. So it's confusing in a way because when you're in construction, you know, is millions and millions of dollars. IT is millions and millions of dollars. But then there's other things where your professional services and 
those things you may be small. And it is possible to be a provider of a large service and a small service by the same company. It depends upon which index code you're, you're actually qualifying under, which goods and services you're providing, and that will determine whether your size standard, as we call it, is acceptable or not. So you're either small or large. But if you're determined to be an other than small or a large business, you must do a subcontracting plan. And if you're a small business, you don't have to. It doesn't mean you can't subcontract. It doesn't mean you can't put a portion of that work in and outsource a portion of that work. That's determined by the contract itself. But what it means is that you don't have to, and you don't have to be uh, accountable for what you do or you don't do. And that's what we're, we're looking at in large business. We hold them accountable that they do that maximum practical opportunities and the best effort to put that money into small businesses. So subcontracting is an excellent way to test the water of federal business without uh, suffering undue risk. Now, what does that mean? It means it's not your job. It's not on your company. It's not, you're not responsible for the final product. That big business Good morning, everyone. Let's just hang tight while we wait. We try to get him back.
All right, I got Jerry and he is jumping back in. So thank you for your patience. Are we set here? Yeah, I just have Jerry, he's trying to get back in. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry I was away for a second. Um, everyone, hold on. Okay, so again, I think everybody knows we're having some trouble with having lost the internet for our speaker. Uh, have you heard anything new, Jody? Are you still here? Or? I have not heard anything no. from him. Me neither. Oh, I know here someone's used to be admitted anyway. That's not. Again, for those of you who are, <clears throat> are, um, wondering what happened here. Somehow it looked like our speaker's internet has, uh, has uh, dropped in. Okay, so let me just see you in the chat here. Somebody's saying, can Jerry tape himself or send us a link or copy? Uh, again, it's just having him trying to get in at, at the moment. Uh, I don't think he can do too much beyond that. We'll see if... Uh, I mean, later this week, yeah. But I don't know yet. Let's see where we stand on this uh, again. Uh, Jerry's just back. I admitted him. Oh, good. All right. Oh, did he drop again? I don't. Okay, while we're waiting, this is a little bit like um, the old joke about, oh, here's Jerry. See, I see his face. I'm, I'm going to turn the camera off to try and stabilize the connection. 
Is that is that better? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, you don't need to see me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was just getting to the part <laughs> about how you follow follow the money within the federal government, and, and it, it is it's kind of bureaucratic. It always is when you're doing anything with the federal government. But at the same time, I think it, it is really worth it um, to do that. So can you, can, I'm still sharing, right? We cannot see your screen now. Okay. No, we need your slides to, you need you to show the slides. There you are. There we are. It's usually not the slide presentation, it's, it's when uh, we're running a camera and everything. And at the same time, I hate to say it, but my wife is upstairs and she's doing the same, she's teaching a class on the same platform. Oh. So she's she's from the Department of Labor. So the labor's on the top, GSA is on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so her presentation is going on right now too. That's probably what caused it. Uh, but always I have to turn my camera off so she can stay online because I guess she looks better on camera than I do. So we're at the point now where we're talking about subcontracting. And here's, here's how it plays out in the federal sector. In the federal sector, the mandate will, they set these goals and the goal for subcontracting is 22% of the federal eligible spend should go to small businesses, 22%. 22% when we're talking about about $2 trillion. That's a lot of money. How do we get that money there and how we break it out is, is what our offices are responsible for to ensure that that money is going. And some of it has to go to what's determined as to be a small disadvantaged businesses. Now, when you're looking at these categories, remember these are federal categories, not state categories. Sometimes they, they are, they're the same, sometimes they're not. What the federal government looks at as a small disadvantaged business is not the same thing as your state certification as a small disadvantaged business or a, um, what they call a small um, SDB, SBE, small business enterprise, the disadvantaged enterprises. But what we're talking about is the same thing. The federal government, the state government and city government sit aside certain portions of their budget and their contractual money to go to help uh, small businesses grow and, and internally and also it small businesses hire more people than large businesses because large businesses hire a couple hundred, small businesses hire a couple thousand. And a lot of time that impact is more local than it is with large business. So we are very committed in the federal sector to help small businesses stay because the pyramid is built on those small businesses. So there are small disadvantaged businesses, there are woman-owned small business, and, and under the woman-owned small business is another subcategory called economically disadvantaged woman-owned woman business. And what that means is that there are certain areas in the market where we can show by historical data that women just, it's just not a fair playing field. Women have been excluded. And a lot of it has to do with things like construction, which is, is very male-oriented. But we're seeing more and more women businesses come about to take advantage of this here, this 5% of the federal spend that go to woman-owned small business and economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. Another thing about the woman-owned small business is that they have a sole source, which allows you to make a contract directly to a woman-owned small, woman small business if they are capable of doing the work. So that's something that we're trying to become more proactive in the federal government and use that. Then there's the service disabled veteran owned small businesses. Notice it says service disabled, not veteran. You can be every service disabled business is a veteran owned business, but not every veteran owned business is a service disabled veteran owned business. The services disability comes through a process through the VA. Well, it used to, the, the, the VA actually certifies your disability, but now SBA is responsible for certifying your company as a service disabled veteran owned small business or small business. That's the big difference here. That is a big factor because the process that, that some companies had gotten used to for years and years within 
uh, the veteran administration has now been turned over to SBA. So you got new players, you got new rules, um, but it's the same customer base that we're trying to get to. And then there's the historically underutilized business zones. Now on hub zones, you hear a lot, and a lot of people say it's about the worst portions of the towns. It's not really. Every time a military base closes, that area around that base usually becomes a hub zone. So those businesses that exist there often have the, the chance to go out and compete for work as a hub zone on business. A lot of times because of that, uh, like in New England and Brunswick, Maine, sits beautiful military base right there on the coast, you know, outside of Camden, houses ranges between two to $20 million. Um, but there was a military base there for a long time, a Navy base. It recently closed. Everything around that base now becomes a hub zone for so many years. Even though it sits in one of the most, you know, wealthy property values, it's the fact that when that base left, it pulled a lot of business out of that area. So what they do is they take those old bases and they used to turn them into uh, incubator sites, commercial zones, where companies can come in and startups move in. So we've seen a lot of startups move into that. Uh, I used to do startups before I came to GSA. I did startups out of Norman, Oklahoma. Tinker Air Force Base sits in Oklahoma City. Tinker Air Force Base is one of the biggest military installations within the continental U.S., but it's also one of the biggest contracting entities with worldwide contracting responsibilities. So around Tinker has all these companies of grown up small companies. The same thing we see here in New England at Hanscom Air Force Base. Hanscom one of the smallest military bases in inventory, but one of the biggest spending entities in the Air Force buying communications and, and different things. So it's important that you understand hub zones because they are often generated by the census track. So you can be a hub zone this year when the next census come out, you'll be totally different because the population has changed, the value of properties changed, the economic standards have changed. So it's one of those really touchy ones and it's a hard one to make for, the, for us in the federal government because of that, that moving uh, definition of what's a hub zone company. But usually if you, you bring your company into an industrial area around old military base, you got five, 10, sometimes 20 years before that area goes out of the hub zone because of the economic impact of drawing down. That's why when bases start closing, it's so important for communities to be involved in those base closures and the impact it's gonna have on them. And it's a good place to also start up your business in that area if you see it, because you can get really good real estate you get very cheap real estate. A lot of times there's a lot of good deals to get you to move there. Uh, the GSA wide business prime and subcon goals, you can always go to this link here and it'll tell you SBA is the one who really sits the goals. They negotiate with the, for the whole federal sector. And once those goals are set, the agency's job then is to try and meet them. If you can't meet them, you just have to explain why. Remember, this is a goal, not a mandate where you will see mandate at the state and municipal levels. You don't see mandates at the federal level because um, you just don't, it's a political thing. We don't mandate um, these numbers, but these are our goals and we work very hard to meet those goals. So we get a scorecard, every agency gets a scorecard every year that will tell us how we met those goals and we get a grade. Um, GSA for the last two years have gotten an A, a a plus, so we were doing pretty good at, at, at the numbers and meeting the goals. But we do do some of, a lot of the most contracts to small businesses. So that's, that's why we're pretty good at that. So this is the FAR regulation, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is basically uh, the contracting officer's Bible to tell them what they're gonna do to utilize small business. But here's one that's important is that to ensure timely payment of amounts due pursuant to the terms of their contract. It gives the agencies the authority to make sure that those small businesses on the subcontracts and things are actually getting paid timely. Usually within 30 days of you of a small business billing, they, they should get payment unless there's something specifically in their contract that allows for a longer period. 
And our job is to enforce that. So if there's a small business out there or you're a small business and you're working for a company as a subcontractor and you're not getting paid and you know that they're working on a federal contract, then you can come to our agency and we can find out you know, what's the problem. We can act on your behalf and facilitate those payments and make sure that you get paid properly. This is a subcontracting directive where you can find information about um, all the different opportunities out there for subcontracting. What it does, it lists the prime contractors and then you can go through and you can contact those guys to make sure, hey, I saw where you have, well, you might have been looking for uh, some builders, you might have been looking for masons, you might be looking for plumbers and it allows you to reach out to them. Uh, the e-library actually is a database that GSA provides that will identify companies who uh, actually are prime contractors who hold contracts with, with the uh, GSA. And those companies will also be your access to look for subcontracting. Now, when you look at the e-library, you're going to see GSA and VA because the VA also these contracts are what we call the multiple award schedules. The multiple award schedules are managed by GSA, but there are some that have to do specifically with medical that the VA manages as a, basically we outsource to the VA because they're the subject knowledge experts within the federal government about medical issues. So they manage those medical schedules, which are basically multiple award contracts that are open all the time. You apply for them uh, and then you're reviewed. And then if you're based upon your review, you're awarded the contract. The contract can be from five to 25 years. So now the thing to understand is that the contract does not guarantee you work. It just is your right to then sell your goods and service to any federal agency who wants to buy off the GSA um, contract, the, the MAS or the multiple award schedule contracts. As you can see there, there are different categories from facilities, human capital, IT, um, they're, they're all there. Uh, we, we buy almost everything. There's a contract for almost everything. Uh, there's also contracts that allow you to emerging technology. If you got a better idea, we'll put it on the GSA schedule. We'll advertise it to all the agencies and those agencies who need it can go right there and buy it off that GSA schedule. Think of this, this is kind of like the old, this is the electronic phone book where you, you advertise in it, and that's where they can find you. The SBA subnet, the SBA subnet is a database that actually lists the prime companies. It allows you to go out and look at uh, companies who have contracts with the federal government. It also allows you to then reach out to them and start networking. Maybe there's some outreach events that they are holding. A lot of uh, large companies hold their own training to train their subcontractors, certification, especially in construction. Uh, they teach you how to bill. You know, they teach you what, quality, what the quality assurance standards are. They make sure you're OSHA certified for safety and all those things. A lot of the larger companies take care of that internally and they list it out there. You can go out there and find it on what they call the SBA directory and subnet. So if you're looking for opportunities or you're thinking about going into uh, the federal space or any space, this applies to almost any type of business you're doing. You wanna make sure that you understand the budgetary information. Like I said, that they have the money. Um, they have money set aside for these things. So you can find that not only through going through the congressional bills, but a federal agency, but almost every state budget has it. And also your, your representative, your congressional rep representatives I can brief you on what money that they fought for and what money they put into the budget. And they can also tell you what projects are coming up within their districts. And uh, within those districts, we stay in contact with them. All the agencies do to keep them informed about uh, what's happening so that they know that, hey, the money that you sent is being used wisely and this is uh, how it's been used, how you expected us to use it. The key players within the agencies is, is one thing. Uh, I will warn you that if you're looking for contracting officers within the federal government, contracting officers are hard for you to touch because usually contracting officers are at the execution stage. The planning stage is program managers. 
program managers throughout most federal agencies and even state and even companies, a program manager's job is to make sure that there's a state good statement of work, make sure that they fought for the money, the budget to make it happen. And when it's all good and that package good, they slide that package over to the contracting officer. And usually when the contracting officer gets it, they have a time factor, 30 to 90 days if they're lucky. Otherwise, sometimes, you know, it's happening so fast. So the chances of you getting to that contracting office to explain everything that's happening is going to be slim to none. But if you're watching these things, like we said earlier, like you're looking at contracts that might expire, there's a contracting officer. The program managers are the ones you want to talk to. They are the subject knowledge expert about the requirement. The contracting officer is the subject knowledge expert on the law of contracting to make sure that the contract happens right. And my office is the compliance portion of them, make sure that the contracting officer, the program manager, are not just making stuff up and giving it to who they want to, but they're following the process. Where our job is to ensure the process is followed and then ensure that small businesses are given the opportunity. And that's where upcoming opportunities is stuff that you see in the system that may be happening. And also when you go into agencies, uh, small business sites, every agency has a small business section it's going to tell you what they consider their internal small business goals. Remember the goals we saw about subcontracting? Those are federal government goals. But each agency has internal goals that it's agreed to, to try and make. And those goals lead us to the federal government goals. So every agency has different goals. And you can go on their website, just like GSA on small business, you can find it there. And know who your competition is. Sometimes your competition can be your best friend. If you're talking, if you belong to any type of associations, any type of professional groups, you guys can work together to come up with a good um, decision on how you're going to actually approach opportunities. You can partner, you can do joint ventures. There's lots of ways that you can work together. And a lot of times working together is a whole lot better than working against each other. Here's tools that you can use to uh, do your market research about in the federal space. Uh, GSA eLibrary, which we talked about earlier, tell you about GSA contracts. Remember, GSA contracts are not just for GSA, they're for every agency, so it's a good thing to know those. And then there's a schedule sales query plus. You go to that website and you'll find, you find all type of information about um, what the federal government is buying and what we spend money on, the ability to assess the size and potential of your target market. It'll give you information about, you know, if, if nobody's playing, maybe you can go in there and, and establish yourself and the penetration into that market is a whole lot less. But if there's a lots of different companies in that, that space, these are the databases that will show you that. USA Spending is, a, is another repository of government transaction and receipts. Uh, the agencies are required to put the information there about how they spend the money. Uh, you'll find a lot of congressional offices review this to see did the GSA spend what they said they did. Let's look at the receipts. It's more like do an audit trail of what an agency is spending on. You can follow all that. If you're into numbers, it's a good thing. If you're not into numbers, you're not into all this data, you can always sign up through the PTAC or, and you can also um, sign up through SBA, SCORE, or the Women uh, Economic Development Centers, Veteran Economic, Veteran Business Development Center. There's so many business development centers out there within the federal government. There's so much information out there. This is just places where you can, if you're like me, you're not a data-centric person. Only thing I need is reports and analysis, trends and analysis to tell me how trends are going. This is what you can do. And also the uh, agencies can help you with that. When I was telling you earlier about, you know, we look at you as far as what you provide, this is what the NICS code is. The NICS code is an industry classification used to identify specific types of industry. It tells, so when GSA puts out a requirement, it'll put it out on their certain NICS code. There's a NICS code for, for IT, there's a NICS code for facility management, there's a NICS code for house cleaning, 
there's a next code out there even for lawn care and all those things so that's how it's like you can do searches. All this will be explained to you by your counselors at, at the development centers so that you understand and make sure that you got the right NICS code identifying what your company does so that when people start looking for you, they are look and they pull up that NICS code, they're going to see your company and wherever it resides. If they're looking for NICS codes in Boston, if your company pop, they're looking for NICS codes in DC, DC, they see it right there. The PSC codes are not so much used by uh, us at GSA. We, we Most of our stuff is using a NICS code, but it's another way of identifying what you do. And there's a manual out there that tells you which PSC basically applies to your goods and services, and you just fill in the data. And, it, and this is all for data searches. So that's what it's, what it's used for. The NICS code is actually used in the contract. It's, it's required by the FAR that the, the contracting officers have to use that. So that will where you will see it. The FPDS NG transition to SAM.gov. Remember we said SAM.gov was very important. If you've been around a while, you probably heard of FedBiz Ops and a whole lot of other databases. But as in 2020, we converted everything to SAM.gov. And this statement is one that we were required to put in all our presentations, remind people that you know, we're all now on SAM.gov, all the information you might be looking for, FPDS, um, you can't find it, you have to go to SAM.gov. So that's is what this is, it's just one of those, those clauses where we're reminding people, hey, if you're still looking for FPDS and stuff, you need to go to SAM.gov to find those things during SAM.gov now. What federal procurement data, same thing, FPDS is lists all the uh, contracts and all the different spends that we did over $10,000 have to be put in there. It's up to the contracting officer to put it in there. And so sometimes that data may be, that data is never really exact because you have constant feed that is constantly being updated. So you might go in on a Monday and it says one thing, you go in on a Friday and it says something completely different. But the thing of it is, it is a portal where we are keeping all that data and it allows you to go in and do data searches and do data analysis, not only agencies, but you can also find companies in there. And these are the things that your counselors at the PTAC and the VA and will help you get to. Trying to catch back up on our time because I wanted to leave as much time as possible for questions. Once again, subcontracting, subcontracting directory and the criteria. That term again, maximum practical opportunities. Yeah. And uh, anytime a large agency gets a contract that exceeds $750,000 or $1.5 million for construction, they must have a subcontracting plan. These, these are websites there or links will be there and you can, so that you can have those. That's why they're there. It allows you to go and find a lot of the stuff. So the things we need you to do is when you hear about any type of um, requirement, you see an RFI or source of soft, we need you to respond. Um, we also need you to attend things from industry days, different events and networking events that the agencies put on. They're doing that so that they can identify whether or not the population out there where people, people want to do that work or people out there exist today at work. So that's why we do it. Uh, strategically manage your time and matchmaking events when you come to them. Uh, try and hit as many companies as you can. Make sure that you got a, a list of those who you definitely want to hit. They're definitely the ones that identify they're buying what you, you have, but there's contracts that they have coming up that you may be able to bid on or you may be able to partner with. Those ones, but the other ones, you, you want to meet as many people as possible because a lot of times people who may not have worked for you may know of people who are looking for people like you. And a lot of times the agencies will say, you know, we don't have anything, but GSA does. We don't have anything but the Corps of Engineers. We don't have anything but the Army, the Air Force, or Coach Firearms is looking for this, or Hewitt Packard is looking for this, Raytheon is looking for, um, MIT Lab is looking for, Harvard is looking for. So that's why you, you meet as many people at these events and stuff. 
And that's and you, why you also network with the other contractors that may be at these events to get to know them, let them know what you do, share business cards, share contact information for any future uh, events to come up. And I always check the eBuy and the other GSA websites for opportunities, along with the websites for all the other agencies like DOD has portals, uh, VA has portals, HHS, CDC, all the federal agencies have these portals where you can go in and see the opportunities or they'll point you to a place where you can see the opportunities. So these are people who can help you out if you're in the space, uh, SBA, Minority Business Development Agency, APTAC, which is now called the Apex Accelerator, but you can still find them on the, if you Google any of these sites, uh, they'll pop up. And of course, GSA and doing business with GSA. Okay, the good part. I know we have some questions. It's, it's a lot of stuff that we were talking about. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we give you the chance. Uh, how are we on time? We can go over a little bit on this one, Jerry. Okay. Uh, it turns out, yeah. Uh, so if you need to go a few minutes over, it's okay. Okay. So uh, the first question, I'm going to kill my stop sharing. I will send this presentation to you guys and you guys will, with, it's being recorded anyway, but I will send a presentation in case you guys want to have this. So. So Jovan already asked that and is, uh, yeah. We will, we will make sure that you have a copy of the slides. Um, and let me also say that you can go to our website, um, www.gsa.gov, and you'll be able to find other events and other presentations that go more in depth um, to not knowing who's on this and, and what you guys are seeking. We didn't go into a lot of details, but as you can probably conclude, GSA has a lot of these opportunities and a lot of uh, opportunities to learn more about how to federal contract and teach you whatever you need to know and point you to a lot of resources that we don't control, but other agencies control. Uh, did I miss somebody? Okay. Uh, okay, often I get companies asking for money to work on our sound.gov, are they legit? Can we do it for free? Uh, you can do it for free. There's nothing that the federal government is going to ever ask you to do that you can do for free. The thing of it is whether you have the time and it's, it's in your wheelhouse. Um, personally, when, when I was a small business, I, I was like, I hire people to do that because then when they mess up, I have somebody to holler at besides, besides holler at myself. We don't, we cannot fair say that any company is good or bad or whatever. But what we can tell you is that almost everything we do is set up so that you can do it yourself. But remember, the bureaucracy of the federal government a lot of times is a lot of stuff that you have to read over and over again so that you get to understand it. Good consultants are good to have if they fit your business model. If you have the money to do it and you can claim it and it doesn't hurt your bottom line, I was, my thing was from, from a personal standpoint was I always use them because they're small businesses too a lot of times. And some of them are reputable, some of them are not, just like anything in life, let the buyer beware. Um, the federal agency, as a federal agency, we don't say don't use them because they're they're another small business. A lot of them, sometimes some of our ex uh, employees at the agencies who have retired and went on and started their own business doing this consultancy work. So they know the process. The one thing I always tell companies, make sure that you read the contract of deliverables and make sure that you're getting what you're paying for. And uh, that at the end of the day, it's your data. You always control your data. If they're building a, 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 a 
something for you. Make sure that you get the password, you get the logins and all that stuff, and you control that. Never give that up because your relationship today may be a bad relationship tomorrow. And you don't want people having control of your accounts and things like that that you don't really trust or you don't. There's no long term relationship there. So basically, yeah. Use them if you can. Uh, I would say, you know, they're just as good at, at doing this as anybody else. It, it's, it's make sure you interview them just like you would if you were hiring an employee, that they have the skill set. And then one thing, you're comfortable with it. That's the only thing that I can recommend to you. But the rest of it is that, yeah, they, they can help you, but you can do it yourself. But if you are two, three, five man company, and you're trying to do some of this work and it may take you three to four months, that's three to four months of lost opportunities that you could be putting towards the contract. Or you could be putting towards gaining the contract while you're just learning how to do this. And that's where the consultant's skill set comes in. When they augment your business practices, they augment your business that allows you to focus on the business and then let them focus on their deliverable. And once they deliver, if you accept it, you accept it. If you don't accept it, then let's negotiate. So yes. Thanks, Christian. Oh, can a nonprofit be a WBE? Okay. The WBE is a state and the DBE is a state certification. Uh, those things, uh, if you want to be a WBE, there's usually a state office that handles uh, minority and um, procurements. Um, depend upon the state in which you live in. If you don't know, go to your state PTAC your state small business district office. They have people in there who can counsel you on whether you need to be a WBE or DBE. If you're looking at the federal level, all the federal certifications that you can get are right now being run by the Small Business Administration. So the Small Business Administration, because every state has a, a district office, uh, some of them have multiple district offices, like the state of New York has like three or four district offices within that state. Um, they are a good place for you to go. And they can all, because they partner with people like the Women Economic Development Centers, B Women Economic Business Networking is WeBank. WeBank and those people can help you get those WB, DB type of certification. The Small Business Development Center that's run by SBA can help you with those state and federal certifications. So SBA is the most logical place because they cover all those things from federal, state, and municipal to be your point of contact on any type of certification you want to get. Now, the WBE and the DBE will count towards a state and sometimes city. Some cities now certify their own disadvantaged businesses as a portion of their economic excuse me, economic development. So uh, that's why, you know, the SBA Small Business Development Center is going to be your, your first touch. And what they can't do, they will have resources to point you to the people who can. Uh, what agency do designation on the federal? Yeah, on the federal level, that's gonna be um, SBA. So if you are, if you're disabled, but not a veteran. Um, so I guess your question is, is there any type of disability type of uh, business? I think that's where you're gonna probably look at your MBE and your DBE. Sometimes things like, um, I know like organizations that reach out for people who hire the blind. Um, usually there is not one who have, let's say physical disability and things like those things. 
um, even some mental disability, those things don't have a, a uh, enterprise or certification process. They, they don't look at it that way. They don't look at your disability as keeping you from um, doing a business. And I know that sometimes it can, but the only one that I know where there is anything like that is for the, the blind. And that's one of them that, uh, what is it called? Ability One. Ability One is an organization that helps uh, people who have mental, physical, and, and uh, visual handicaps not only seek work, but they also can help you in starting businesses. So Google, uh, do a Google search for Ability One. Um, there's another name for them. But they, they, can, they can help you. And, and also, this is something that the SBA can also point you to as a resource. Uh, I'm quite sure SCORE can also help you with that. How do we see winning proposals that do not have proprietary causes? The requirement is not to the federal government is not to uh, post the proposal as submitted, the winning proposal. But if you are actually, it's going, the information about who got it, you know, the, the proposal itself is going to come out. And that proposal is going to give you certain information, certain questions. And once you do it, the people who submit their proposals, because a lot, it is considered proprietary until the award. At the time of award, they will announce who won, won the, uh, the bidding. If you were one of the companies who bid on the, on the opportunity, you have a right to a debrief to tell you why you did and why your, your proposal might have been short. But it does not give you access to what other people proposed. Uh, you can get a lot of information out of it based upon how the award is written and stuff. And sometimes a lot of agencies will actually put a copy of the contract itself into the system so you can see the contract uh, with the deliverables and everything. But no, what they bid on and, and how they wrote it. Now, if you want to learn how to write proposals, WeBank, Women Entrepreneurial Network, has a great uh, system of helping women uh, develop the business skill that's need to not only be at our work, but also the documentation. They need things like proposals, also how to balance your books. Because remember, one of the things the federal government looked at is your finances and how do you, how are you going to bill? So they try and standardize the billing. So they help you sit, sit all that up. So that's one of the, the things that offered by the business development centers. Okay, um, we got any more questions? I'm not sorry, Christine was the last one at 11.32. Now I just went back to my short cost. Um, John, I, I don't see, I don't, see, I don't see anyone else. I think we, I think that's everybody, Jerry. Okay. Yeah. I really want to thank you so yeah. much for being here, and uh, again, our apologies for the glitches in the middle of this. Uh, I don't think that was you. I think that was me. <laughs> I, th I think that was the universe trying to make things difficult for us. But, uh, I think we I, prevailed. I think we've gotten so used to doing so much uh, from from different locations, we forget the fact that when we were all in one building, we had some of the biggest data pipes coming into those buildings. <laughs> and I live in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm only 50 yards from the water. Mm. So I'm at the end of my 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 tether. <laughs> Quite literally. So 
sometimes radio frequencies are, are being bounced everywhere except down here along the thing because we don't allow them to put antennas along uh, our shoreline. So that's 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 the price you pay for sitting here looking out and watching the, the tide go out. <laughs> well, hopefully in better weather than you've been having for a while anyway. Um, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, and just again, everybody, our next event is the uh, noontime plenary at 12 noon. Our speaker will be Chad Dion Lassiter. And uh, I look forward to seeing you then at the rest of the conference. Have a good day, everyone. Hey, John, and I will send you guys a copy of the slide presentations in case your people want. Excellent. And that, by the way, the slides and any of the recordings should also be available under resources on the Fair Housing and Civil Rights Conference website in about two weeks so that if you don't, anyone who wants to get them and hasn't gotten them already by then, uh, you will, you'll be able to find them there. Appreciate you. Thanks for the time, guys. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day, Have everyone. Day.